Uh, we're about ready to get started. Um, uh, this is the MMTC CEO panel. We did it last year. It was a great hit. Uh, we thought we'd do it again this year. Um, we have Jose Hidalgo of Knox Medical. We got Ken Rivers of True Lead. We got Mike Smolin of Altman Lou. And we got Brady Cobb of Symphony and Biosign. Um, thank you very much for uh, doing the panel this year. We really appreciate it. Being part of it. So, one of the things we wanted to talk during the session is the different companies' approach to marketing. And Truly and Knox were one of the first ones to actually uh, get licenses in Florida. And Brady Cobb and uh, Cynthia and Mike Smolin have all been the recent newcomers. So, what we'd like to do is have each one talk about the company, the culture, their approach. And then basically, um, you know, we have the old guard versus the new guard uh, talk about the differences and maybe what they've learned. So uh, with that, I'll pass it to Jose. And, um, David? Go to the Knox's approach to market. Hello. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming today. I, I was telling Kim earlier that uh, I guess this is the event that we do once a year. We get an opportunity to talk uh, to the people that are you know, uh, paramount to making this interview to go. And it's good to see all of you guys here, and I appreciate you guys all here and taking the time to meet with us today. Uh, what's our approach to market? Well, my name is Jose Hidalgo, the founder and uh, CEO of Knox Medical. Uh, our goal is to provide the most effective and safest medicine to our global patients. Pretty simple, one that is rooted in scientific research, significant testing, and obviously uh, providing in the most compassionate and caring environment uh, possible. We've learned in Florida that even though the population of patients continues to grow, a lot of these patients really have never primary one that before in their lives. Uh, they're no different than me. I was in a near fatal accident in uh, 2011. And I was left with a bunch of injuries that was hitting on my driver uh, on my bicycle. And I became part of that demographic, right? The one that gets uh, the opioids. And in 2011, I didn't know the cannabis existed as a medicine. I only learned about cannabis uh, when we started in the industry about four years ago. So have I known that cannabis could be as effective, truly the conditions that being my recovery from my injuries would have been a lot uh, faster and uh, less painful. So uh, I can relate to our patients, and uh, it gives a lot of purpose. Uh, to feel that we can bring this medicine and affect the lives of millions. And uh, we're very excited and very honored to be able to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Um, so I'm Kim Rivers. I'm the CEO of True Leave. And um, it's kind of funny to be called the old guard um, since uh, you know, our company has been in existence yeah. for approximately three years now. Um, we've been uh, selling uh, medical cannabis in Florida for a little over two. Um, and uh, we always say, though, in cannabis, right, that it's dog years. So we say that uh, for every year, it's like seven years in any other industry or business. I'm um, so glad to see um, some new faces here today. Um, so truly, um, of course, it's the first and we're the largest um, medical cannabis provider in the state of Florida. Um, and really, our motto is that it truly grows one patient at a time. And so we're a very patient-centered um, company, and we have looked at the entire supply chain with patients and uh, whether it be the quality of our, of our product or uh, the types of product mix that we're, we're offering. Um, a lot of our products are based uh, from feedback that we receive both from patients and from physicians. Uh, we try to be uh, number one in customer service, not just for cannabis, but for really any industry. So that's something that we're very, very passionate about. Uh, and so, you know, really, um, at Truly, also, one of the things that we believe strongly in is partnering with the movement um, and standing beside patients as we push um, forward uh, the conversation related to cannabis um, in Florida and now beyond. So, um, I'm proud and happy to be here today and I appreciate all of you and your um, commitment to the movement as we, as we move onward. So, thanks for having me. Thank you. And Mike. Can you talk about how Altman has, um, what your approach to market is, how you come in as a newer player, and, and how your approach is a little different than the rest? Yes, I'm the founder of, of Altman. I've uh, spent a number of years in the pharmaceutical. Is that working? Is 
spent a number of years in the pharmaceutical biotech industry, uh, was fortunate enough to work for some great startups. So was part of building some wonderful models. The last company that I worked for was a company that developed a product that saved the lives of thousands of infants in this country. So I've always been focused on working for companies that are developing innovative products for serious diseases with unmet needs. What brought me to the space after having been retired for 10 years from the biotech industry was, was really a couple personal things. First and foremost, my daughter suffers from epilepsy. And I had her first grand mal seizure sitting on my lap at two and a half. Horrible experience. The next 10 years were even a worse experience, watching how she responded to the pharmaceutical drug she was on. Seizures were controlled, the side effects were devastating. And uh, I saw some work being done in Israel with, uh, with cannabis, decided in 2014 that I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to build a premier medical cannabis company in the US, starting in Florida. Um, there are a lot of things that we do, just like the other CEOs on the panel. We set very high standards for the kind of grow that we've built. We've got 150,000 square foot indoor grow, state-of-the-art lab process and manufacturing. We're building out beautiful dispensaries. We hire great people. Customer service is, is at a premium for us. But if there's one thing that I think really separates us from the pack is our commitment and what we put into research and development and product development. We actually started our product development program all the way back in 2014. When we had an opportunity to, to apply for a Charlotte's Web license, we took a different course. We went out to Arizona, we moved all our people out there and built a vertically integrated operation so that we could develop our line of products. Today, I think we have what I would think are the most innovative, complete line of medical cannabis uh, products in the state. I think a couple things really speak to that. We now have 11 different licensing agreements to bring the move line into other states, which will be announced very shortly, with Colorado and California. We have a great play in Canada. And we've been invited, uh, Chief Scientist uh, and myself, to London mid-January to talk to regulators in London as well as Germany to bring the move line of products there as well. So it's really our focus to developing the best possible products. We've brought great products already to the market. What we're going to be bringing in the next 90 days, I think, will make some people very happy when they see what we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Can you talk about um, your recent uh, buying and selling and everything with regards to uh, Three Boys and how Three Boys and a really good company? You guys are already doing more of a national, global aspect. Skippy and Bioscience is a research and development company that started and accepted in 2012. And it actually funded the FDA approved uh, clinical research at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. And it was a cannabinoid therapy used to see, treat CTE and head trauma. Uh, we had a lot of partners within the NFL, we had partners with other head trauma based institutions, and we funded along with Afria uh, a phase one clinical trial. We got through the first uh, animal based trial with positive results, and we're now progressing to human trials. That's all being administered at UM. Uh, we welcome tours down there if anyone, especially if you've ever had interest in seeing it. But at our core, we are truly a medical company. Uh, I came into this space and paid attention to it after I watched my father battle cancer, prostate and bone cancer, who is uh, until he unfortunately passed in 2010. And I saw how much cannabis helped him in dealing with day-to-day -day issues. I'm a big believer in the medicine. And we looked at Florida as an opportunity as a local Florida guy to really make an impact. I previously was chief legal officer for Liberty Health Sciences, which was the first license transfer that we actually completed in the state of Florida, and the first public company with a Florida asset uh, that we brought to market uh, 2017, July. So Scythian previously had interest throughout Latin America. We had research and development contracts in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, and Jamaica. We sold those to Afria to pivot exclusively into the United States in both the hemp and CBD markets as well as the THC markets. Uh, but we take a pure medical approach. To us, what's most important is, yes, the rec market is going to be great, and yes, it needs to be serviced, but the long-term play for us is this, this plant really does change people's lives, and what's sorely lacking, where we've invested a lot of time and energy in Washington, D.C., to open up research. I can't tell you how hard it was to get a DEA license to handle cannabis in the city of Miami, given Miami Vice and everything else we've had in South Florida. So when we first went and met with the DEA and said we wanted a DEA license at the University of Miami, they said, where? Uh, 
but we got it done. And we have a very strong commitment to research, but we also are rolling out, uh, we're currently at 19 locations secured throughout the state of Florida. And it's going to be based on a similar to my uh, fellow CEOs up here. It is a patient and physician-centric approach. Patients don't necessarily know the various different benefits of cannabis, and physicians don't necessarily know and or are scared to enter into the space. So for us, it's about educating the physicians as much as it's educating the patients, because physicians become comfortable with it and see the various different treatments, they're gonna be more comfortable in prescribing it. Our chief medical officer, Dr. Michael Barnes, who's based in London, is one of the foremost experts. He's actually the only prescribing physician in the UK right now. That first prescription that was ready for the girl for Tilray, that was him. And he is uh, just launched the Academy of Medical Cannabis Research, which is an e-learning platform in Europe. And we're very excited about both what we're gonna do here in Florida in the U.S., but also in Europe. Um, that's a good point. I just want to come back to some of the facts that, um, Jose, you guys are also international. Sure. So you guys are operating in Columbia, so we are, we're a global company. We are today in Florida, Texas, Puerto Rico, Pennsylvania, Washington, Oregon, California, Canada, Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, Europe, and Australia. Uh, operating in four continents uh, today. So we basically up here, we have multinational companies working across the globe from here in Florida. Um, and yeah, we don't need to So it's, uh, it's an amazing um, thing to see uh, compared to obviously and other uh, degrees. Um, is it truly? Uh, truly, it's Florida Brown. So uh, we are homegrown. Uh, so uh, we have a uh, board of directors um, who are all Florida, Florida natives. I'm born and raised in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, we're proud of that. So we're proud that we were able to build this company um, from scratch um, in Florida, which we believe is the leading medical cannabis uh, market in the country. Um, when you look at opportunity, when you look at patient growth, uh, I mean, we've got one of the fastest medical growing uh, medical uh, programs in the country. Um, I think last week actually was a, a record week. Over 3,000 patients were added to the registry. So it's a very quickly evolving program here. We have strategically um, made the decision to make sure that we are able to operate um, correctly and well here in Florida um, and to make sure that we can service the patients of Florida. Um, again, it's at our core um, to have um, patient access. When we applied for our license back in 2014, we made a commitment and we, and we view that very seriously and have viewed that very seriously. We've made a commitment to the patients in Florida to provide access to cannabis. And so um, with our approach in terms of building out our retail footprint, in terms of building our product line, we have over 150 SKUs. Um, so we have the most diverse and largest product line in Florida. Um, and, and really that was so that we could make sure that the patients in Florida first and foremost were taken care of. Now that that's done, not completely done, it's never completely done, but now that we've got um, a good, uh, our feet underneath us, we are looking elsewhere, so stay tuned, and I can't talk anymore about that because it's a public company now, right? So um, I have to always keep that in the back of my mind, but um, we, will be, we will be expanding. We look forward to bringing um, the True Leave um, brand, the True Leave uh, way of, again, partnering with patients across the country, and also our commitment to transparency. Well, that actually is a good transition into plant mess and plant science, and then how um, does each one of your companies approach like dosage units, things like that, for recommending positions, how do you go from on that? Um, could you speak to, to that again? Sure. Well, I think, uh, as I alluded earlier, it's a global company. Um, we have the fortune that obviously we can serve patients all over the world. And uh, like him, you know, we're locals and I guess we're the only two that companies that are truly from Florida. Which I always bring it up because I think it's remarkable and I think it's great that we have, uh, you know, other players coming in and I, and I certainly uh, welcome uh, the level of professionalism that's coming into the business because I think it's gonna help and it's gonna do for everybody else. But as a lo global company, not only have the ability obviously to operate in four continents and that's great in helping the lives of millions, but a lot of, the, because of the regulations and because of the way the United States cannabis laws work, there's a lot of the research that cannot be conducted in the United States. And that is a challenge, obviously. So, for example, uh, now we are part of what is called the Clinical Register Program in Pennsylvania, which is basically you have to partner with the universities so you can conduct serial clinical research. 
So there's going to be four uh, clinical studies that we're going to conduct. But that is still limited. You know, we're working with Harvard University. Uh, we're working with the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, uh, which has 300,000 students. We're working with the University of Sao Paulo. We're working with the University of Bogota. Uh, we're working with the University of Sydney. Uh, we're working with Oxford. And the challenge with this is that the good news is that physicians understand that they need to go overseas to try this drug. Uh, penicillin, uh, the polio vaccine, 90% uh, of medicines that were uh, sold this year in the United States, they started conducting the trials outside of the United States because it's so restricted to come and, and, and get this business going here. I think that's gonna change uh, hopefully very soon, but we have the opportunity that we can begin conducting these clinical studies around the world so we can then uh, begin applying this, uh, to the point of uh, one of my colleagues was saying earlier to bring the medicines here because uh, the medical world, which I love to hear the community from regarding medical, is very different than the adult use. Uh, you have to make sure that your product has a specific uh, consistency, and we specialize in that. We want to make sure that the variation of formulation between batch to batch, uh, we exceed in pharmaceutical standards of 1%. Uh, even though you're dealing with a plant base as your, as your raw material, you have to make sure that your medicines are homogenized in a way that a doctor can prescribe you feel safe prescribing. And also, most importantly, you want to make sure that you have a consistent uh, supply of inventory. So when you're a parent and you have an epileptic child or you're dealing with uh, some of the more serious conditions that we're dealing with, you know that that medicine is going to be there month in and month out. So we take that commitment very seriously. It's definitely rooted in clinical research. Testing is a huge part of the process. Not just the ultimate uh, medicine that makes it into the shelves of our dispensaries, but also throughout the entire process. You know, we're growing greenhouses, it's a very complex environment to grow in, but we feel that is the best way to grow a plant is under the natural sunlight. And for that, we test throughout the process. So we test from the mothers to vegetation, from the tissue culture lab, all the way out to the formulation, to our extraction, and what ultimately makes it into, uh, into our shelves. So we think that that overall approach, I think it was to Keith's point, it was pioneered here in Florida. We were forced to be vertical in an industry that has been horizontal. But what I can tell you is that the only way that you can provide this level of customer service and the only way you can stand behind this type of formulations and investments that all of us are making uh, in terms of research is by being vertically integrated. Currently, we have 10 PhDs that work here uh, full time in the company. Uh, and that continues moving forward because as we've all learned, uh, the investment that you have to make for research is significant. So I think that Florida is going to continue leading the way, I agree, uh, in the country and in the world. It's a huge market, it's a tremendous population base, and things will continue moving forward. And uh, we all play an important role in making sure that people out there understand that we're very serious about medical cannabis. And like I said, I have no issue with adult use. I think that that is infinitely when that happens. But what we've learned in places like the West Coast is that there's not a single medical cannabis dispensary in the West Coast. So you know that there is a population of patients that are now underserved because everything has moved uh, to adult use. So that's a problem that uh, as an industry we need to address as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike, can you talk about how you guys uh, um, your dosage units and, and how you do uh, all things you call? Sure. Uh, first thing I want to clarify, I just want to make sure everybody knows we are a Florida-based company. Have been, always will be. We started in Sarasota, Florida, and uh, in Apollo Beach. All of our chemists, and we have a number of them, PhD chemists, have come from universities in Florida. Our MDs are all from Florida. Uh, when we went out of here, I think that's awesome because you hear in the news that a lot of, I, I call this a robust secondary market for, for the buy and sell of, of licenses. And I think it's really cool that there's so many of us that are local people, that are local business people, that are here operating. And I don't think that's something that we say out there enough. So oh, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Um, you know, I guess the other piece that, uh, you know, has, has been very important that you should know is even when we went out to Arizona, we sent our Florida people out there. They moved out there, committed two years to move out there and come back and bring the learnings uh, from them. But I'll tell you specifically what we've been doing on our R&D side. We haven't been waiting for this thing to move to a schedule or two so that we can do clinical trials. There are things that we can do, and I'm going to give you specifics. We have been devoted from day one to developing devices to deliver medical cannabis where you can get more precise doses. And I'll give you an example. We have uh, something I'm very proud of. We have filed a patent for it. 
Uh, we have an encapsulated transdermal gel technology that we put into our patch. We now have a great 72-hour uh, duration of action patch, which is terrific. We have a meter dose inhaler. We have a number of products where we've developed the right devices to deliver medical cannabis. We have a, uh, a device that we're going to be rolling out in the next few weeks. Uh, it's a line of nebulizers and vaporizers that actually have a smartphone app where we can actually uh, track strain effectiveness, compliance, uh, efficacy, the efficacy of the product. So we're excited about that as well. We hope to be working with physicians on that front. But I, I want to make sure that everybody knows that you know we're a company, first and foremost, that's committed to, to R&D and product development. And I can't wait until we have the opportunity to do real clinical trials, because I can tell you, as a guy that came from the pharmaceutical industry, this plant is a miracle plant, and we are going to perform very, very well against products that are out there on the pharmaceutical side. Absolutely. Well, let me clarify this. They are all Florida companies. So, I, mean, I know this, but they've, but they've gone outside the borders of Florida. Uh, so uh, definitely proud uh, that uh, this is happening in Florida. Um, we talked to uh, some of your R&D and, and with respect to your products and the different things that you're going to be producing. Yeah, we, I mean, for us, the key was how do you conduct sustained research besides your own internal research when you still have a Schedule One issue in the federal government? So we've dedicated from the moment that we decided to enter the U.S. and even prior to that, and engaged uh, a group called the BGR Group in Washington, D.C., Haley Barber's Lobby Group. We had Jeff Sessions, former chief of staff, as our head federal lobbyist. And we have yet spent a lot of time up there educating policymakers in D.C. And it was a, an approach that people say, what does that have to do with R&D? Well, until we have the ability to actually conduct it out in the sunlight, how are we going to get something into, into a physician's paper that a physician is willing to read and rely on? So the Meds Act, filed by Orrin Hatch. Orrin Hatch is a senator from Utah, 70 years, 72 years old, never had a Coca-Cola because it has caffeine in it. He sponsored the Meds Act. And he sponsored the Meds Act because he said enough of my constituents have walked into my office in Utah and told me this works for their son, their daughter, their brother, their sister. And you guys have shown me enough in research and what it could potentially do that we need to open it up. And I do want to give a cheers to uh, the gentleman that defeated Pete Sessions last night in Texas. Now that, the that is a victory. Now that the roadblock to legislation and the one-man veto in the House Rules Committee is gone, stuff like the Meds Act can actually move along. And that's critical to us because we've already made a $16 million investment in R&D at the University of Miami. And that was a two-year process just to get a DEA license. That's for one therapy. I cannot applaud GW Pharmaceuticals enough for being the first one across the line. But that's for a very limited condition state. We're looking currently at developing and already drafting clinical trials via the Three Boys medical team, which is tremendous, and Dr. Gergen and Dr. Zeno, uh, who's the chair of neurology at USF, but also with our with our medical director, Dr. Michael Barnes in London, at pain, cancer-specific cancer pain, non-cancer-specific pain. Specific trials and designed trials that will likely be conducted overseas as Jose in the first couple rounds so we see that it works and then brought here to be made something that we can make public and make something that's going to change people's lives that they don't have to jump through five or six hoops to get. That is ultimately the goal for us and the only way that's going to happen is by changing and fixing the log jam in DC and last night we had a very significant step towards doing that. Ken, can you talk about how you guys are actually reducing and then actually I know you work with several labs down here too. So. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> we do. Um, so a couple, a couple of things. First of all, um, truly at the very beginning, and actually this is again kind of a, a testament to our uh, culture of uh, being responsive and listening to patients. So I had a mom uh, call me uh, for about three months into producing products, and she called me and she had a son. Um, her name is Renee. And she's got a son Brandon, who many of you may know. Um, who called and actually said, you know, Kim, I appreciate that you're making products now, but how do I know that what you say is in it is actually in it? Um, you know, I've got this very complex, um, you know, condition um, with my son, and you know, and he was diagnosed when he was eight. Well, I just so happen to have an eight-year-old, and I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. Let me send you the full lab report. And she said, well, if you can send me the lab report so easily, why wouldn't you make that available for everyone? And I said, you know what? You're right. And so transparency is key. That's key to who we are. So we provide every single lab report, the full panel. We've done it since three months in. 
uh, to, on any batch of our products available on the website. So it's important for us, for patients to, to also be, again, partners in their own, um, in their own you know, solutions, right? And, and having them become educated with what's in their medicine and what works for them. And really the only way to do that is, again, to provide the information to them um, in a very transparent manner. So uh, we are, we third-party lab test every single batch of our products. We're very excited and supportive of the lab regulations that are coming out from the Department of Health. Everyone should be on the lookout for those. Um, right now, as I propose, they are the most stringent lab, lab um, testing requirements in the country. We believe in that, actually, and we're supportive of that because we believe that our patients and that us as an industry should be held to very high standards. And so we appreciate that effort by the Department of Health. Um, you know, the other thing that we're doing with respect to research, just to divert a little bit, um, we actually have conducted um, an IRB study. We partnered with Florida State University. Uh, the results of that, we've like 2,000 participants, so it's going to be one of the largest sample sizes of research that comes with this to be published. Um, look for that to be published in the first quarter of next year. We're very excited about that. We're very excited to have that, those data points going into session um, to help advocate for some of our initiatives, such as opioid replacement therapy. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that in this country, um, there is not an alternative that's a natural and safe and proven alternative um, to, opioid, um, to opioids available in the state of Florida when we have one of the highest rates of um, opioid addiction uh, in the country. So that's something that truly and hopefully others up here will get behind as we fight to move that, move that conversation forward um, this next session. Um, in terms of R&D, we have, and some of you guys know, our R&D team. Um, they're very passionate about what they do. We've got a number of new products. We just released Delta 8, which um, you all may know about. That's uh, one of the kind of lesser known cannabinoids um, that we're um, introducing into products that stimulates appetite and also has less of a psychoactive effect. Um, so we're excited about that product that was asked for by physicians. We also are launching um, additional products with cannabis derived terpenes, which is something that you all asked for. Um, we're bringing those to market at scale. Um, and we've got some amazing nanotechnologies <coughs> that we're getting ready to release that we're really excited about as well. But on the research side, I don't buy, okay, and I apologize, but I just don't. I don't buy the fact that we can't do it in Florida. And so I started conversations. This is another initiative moving in this session. There's no reason why the four of us on this panel and the rest of the MMTCs and all of you can't get behind and introduce initiatives in the legislature that allows for clinical testing within Florida um, because we are regulated within the walls of our state. And I think that there is support from legislators that I've talked to and regulators that I've talked to. And we can be the leader. Um, we've got the market size. We've got the companies who obviously are sophisticated enough to lead the way in that research. And so I'm hopeful that we can, with this study going into session, along with some of the great um, initiatives that the folks up here have been talking about, that we can band together, we can provide a platform for world-class research that comes out of our state. So, Awesome. Uh, one thing I want to add, I, I agree with, with, with Kim, that uh, we have to be able to perform that clinical, even if it's just clinical efficacy studies, the ones that we're doing, the, our partner in Philadelphia is the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, so we're mimicking to the extent that the conditions are allowed. But one thing I didn't want to lose sight of is that you hear us talking a bunch of clinical trials and formulation and rare cannabinoids, but everything really starts with the plant, right? So um, you're dealing, and that's where things really get complicated in the United States because you cannot transport plant material from state to state. So one of the one of the things that attracted us to Colombia early on is that we were able to register the world's largest privately held seed bank. Why was this important? Because we can conduct real uh, genetic uh, research for strains in a country that allows us to do that. Most importantly, you can uh, register in the country legally, so when we go to other places, you can ship actually certified genetics. But the genetic development of the plan is something that you guys need to be paying attention to, and that's something that's going to pick up speed very, very rapidly in the industry because we come from an adult use, the pioneers in the West Coast, is all about high THC. So all the strains develop high THC, high THC, high THC. Some of you that have spoken with patients have probably realized that not everybody wants to be on high THC all day long because it's very hard to operate. And you know, I like to have a good time just like the next guy, but I'm gonna tell you that we have jobs, we have families, we have to operate. So and we know that there are alternatives to do that. So 
I think that what you're going to start seeing in, uh, in the Kim Soin or the Delta A, or what I call the expression of the rare cannabinoids in the THCBs and the THCBAs, uh, and all of the other cannabinoids, plus breakthroughs in other cannabinoids that are really not known what the effects are on the human beings, I think you're going to see a really interesting genetic development of cheaper drugs, which is PhD from the University of Paris, San Jose. We are where corn was at the turn of the century. You're across pollinating. There is no genetic improvement of raw material that's taking place in this industry. Not only do you need to express a rare cannabinoid, but you also need to have the ability to have stronger plants, plants that deal better in climate, that have shorter flowering periods, that give you a bigger yield so you can then produce more medicine at a lower cost, which ultimately we want to make sure that we bring a medicine that's accessible to as many people as possible. So, you know, I think that this is, and I agree with, with my colleagues here, this is such an exciting time uh, to be part of this industry. It's, it's such an honor for us to be at the forefront in doing this, but as complicated as the human genetic development side of the medicines are gonna be, equally as complicated are gonna be on the plant side, and then it's gonna be the merging of both as to how we're going to arrive to condition specifics, making responsible claims, not telling people that really are helpless, you should try this for whatever or other condition. I think we have to take a very responsible approach and making sure people that understand this is what we've done, and this is, to Kim's point, we have a significant enough population that we can say, we treated 100,000 people in Florida, okay? We may not have clinical trials, they may not be uh, done their way, and in the medicine world, uh, anecdotal trials are very valid and they're, and they're very effective. So I think that we're definitely in a very exciting time, but I just wanted to touch on the plant side because the plant and the human side are one that are coming together here. And that's where the breakthrough of medicine really is gonna take place. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, I know that you guys do genetic testing, uh, guys and guys. Um, Mike, can you talk about genetic testing a little bit? Sure. So um, it, it does all start with great genetics. And we were fortunate enough to to bring in some great genetics to, to our operation. Uh, again, we have over 60 strains. We have two real focuses uh, in our lab in Florida. You know, one is on product development and device development. The other side is doing very aggressive studies and looking at, at our specific strains. What we're trying to do is determine uh, you know, whether or not there are new uh, cannabinoids out there that can be used. We're, you know, we're evaluating that. We're, we're looking at uh, terpenes to see which ones really um, are responsible for the entourage effect in lieu of sativas and indicas. So, uh, you know, a lot of the product development that we do is targeted based on some of the work that we're finding as we're studying and evaluating our strains. So we've invested in some pretty serious equipment, which we'd be happy to show people if they ever come in uh, to see what we're doing. But it's it's a very important part of what Altman is doing today. Awesome. Could you all say how many strains you guys uh, have and uh, like what type of dominant you do? You know, you're talking about the Delta, you're talking about genetics from the seed bank, how that can affect everything differently. Can you actually um, talk about how many different strains each one of your operations currently has? We have over 70 uh, strains and uh, we're consistently, uh, part of our business is to consistently uh, do uh, from, from seed primarily, um, although we are in, uh, over the next six months, we are going to be um, uh, building and releasing a, a tissue tissue culture lab, so uh, we'll be adding tissue culture capabilities to um, trees. Um, I guess suite of, uh, of research and R&D, but we do, and I think it's important to note that we do phyllos test every single one of our strains. So we partner with a third, a third company, again, that third party validation and transparency with our patients is important. So if you go to um, phyllos, and it's the phyllos galaxy, you can actually type in true lead and all of our genetics um, are there, and you can see the relationship of uh, strains that we have to other cuts across the entire country. It's really, it's really quite a cool and um, in a, a neat uh, database. So we do uh, we do look at that third party validation because you know when you're growing from seed, as we all know, um, you can be told that it's one thing, and then um, once you actually grow the plant, you um, and then we we actually have that happen where we send it out, send it off to Phylos and realize that oh, it's actually something completely different. So it's very important for us to to make sure that we are um, selling only what we intend to be selling to our patients. Thank you. And Brady, can you touch upon that? 
Currently at Three Boys, we're north of 70 strands as well. Um, we do, and we're very proud that we added recently Chris Keller, who is the master grower at Incredibles, one of the better extracts and edibles companies out of Colorado. We added him on as one of our master growers. We are a fully organic company, and once we get through this transaction with our partner, Verano, uh, we'll add in the additional eight states plus Puerto Rico that they have and 150 SKUs, uh, we'll be well north of 100. Uh, with a multitude of offerings and a very substantial, they already have a five year head start on a bunch of clinical research based out of their Illinois and their Maryland operations. And they were very key and I'd love to speak with Kim and see how we can work together on the opioid replacement because they were the critical drivers of that when it passed in Illinois. So we're very excited to have Chris on board and we're also very excited to add the Verano team on board as well. Well, you know, the opioid, the opioid replacement is one of the four clinical trials we're doing in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's legal, it's legal in New York, right? They, they said that if you have an opioid addiction... Oh my gosh, we all agree. Did y'all hear? Did y'all hear that? Okay, can we just say that like, we, are, we are all committed to opioid replacement therapy? That's huge. Yes. Like, it's so exciting. Yes. I, can, I can tell you without going into, into too many of the painful details that I fully understand how toxic these uh, opioids can be for you. You know, uh, when you're laying in a bed for two weeks, and nothing works, and the only thing that can take the pain away are these things that are so toxic for you, that destroy your liver, that really change your mood and everything else. I can tell you that it's a really horrible drug that is known for a long time. But one thing I want to talk about is about the genetics. Uh, I want to ask how many strains. Not yeah, that's, that's where I wanted, I wanted to go. So, so we have 296 uh, certified strains within the Gokin Cola, right? So right now uh, we, are, uh, we have eight different strains that we roll out to market. So it takes us a little bit longer. Uh, we listen to our patients, but we also listen to the uh, physician community and the research part of the company. So what we want to make sure that we do is that we put out as many products that we have tested that we feel we can be consistent and that can really address these very serious conditions that our patients are encountering. Uh, other than, and then obviously the different formulations and the different presentations uh, so people can deal with the various conditions that they have uh, and make sure that they can get the, the proper relief, right? So I think the presentations are important, uh, whether they are, um, you know, the suppositories or the capsules or vaporizers or nebulizers or transdermal patches or nasal sprays and whatever we can do to make sure that we give people enough options so they can treat these conditions and most importantly, uh, which is something that we're very focused on is to make it as bioavailable as possible. So there are a variety of other uh, known, uh, you know, natural, uh, and like Brady, you know, we're 100% organic, we call them unrecertified. I think that that's what everybody really expects these days. So, you know, but again, just like nobody knew that we were all from Florida, I think it's something that is important to know uh, that, you know, we are, but we should be very proud because even though we're all homegrown companies, we're now global companies, and it all started here in Florida, right? And one thing I want to touch on, just on the opioid replacement, is we recently read and are reviewing a study that came out that actually shows that the number one opioid prescribed for cancer-related pain also serves as one of the largest accelerators for, for the cancer to spread throughout the human body. So, yeah, go figure. So, so that is, a, it's a preliminary study and findings that came out of a research physician at Harvard that we're looking at designing a study to actually target replacing that drug with a CBD or THC-based therapy that could that get people off that opioid. That means a lot to me because I, my father was in bone cancer it is not pleasant, and it was to a point where he wouldn't even take the opioids, he'd rather deal with the pain. I can, tell you, from, they felt. I can tell you from personal experience, again, that I don't think you are going to be able to replace it completely. No. Because when you are, when you are in, in, this, in this serious conditions and you're, you're bad with, you know, but I do think that the volume that we're given can be significantly different. Yes. That for sure. Yes. One of the things that uh, I'm still sort of stunned over, um, is the fact that we're still messing around with this drug as a Schedule One drug. When you think back to three years ago, there was, I thought, an important study that came out in the Journal of American Medical Association that showed that in the 26 states that had medical cannabis programs, overdose, accidental overdose death rates uh, were down 30%. I mean, that's incredible. And here we are three years later, and we still haven't moved the dial as far as we should. Should have been game over right then and there with that kind of of, uh, of data. So I'm, I'm really, you're, you're absolutely right. That's, that's the place that we can go right now. 
Well, that's, that's awesome. And I would just encourage everyone in this room, though, to make sure that we're all involved in that conversation because sitting through, um, and sometimes it's a, it's a blessing and a curse, right, to be in Tallahassee. So um, sitting through the, uh, the panel that just happened with respect to dosing, um, dosing rulemaking, um, and I don't know if any, any of you all watched the six hour deliberations that, um, that happened, but um, you know, half of that panel were made, were made up of physicians, and a few of those were representatives from the largest physician organizations in Florida, including um, FMA um, and, and others, and I would just tell you that it was like we were in a time warp with the comments, because literally the comments were, we are at, on, the, on the beginning of where opioids were, and we just don't have enough information. And they were operating from a place of fear as opposed, from, as opposed to a place of acceptance. And so I think that's on us, quite frankly, um, to educate and continue to, um, to, to bring a specific, again, again research-based um, information to the physician community. Um, but when we have those types of physicians that are on panels that are then um, setting dosing limitations for our industry, um, that becomes a red flag, and that's and that's a really, you know, for me anyway, it was an aha moment that we all have a lot more work to do um, in Florida, and that's also why you hear the passion in my voice with respect to not only this opioid replacement therapy, but also this research initiative, um, because without good data, right, it's hard to it's hard to change um, opinions, particularly those of physicians. So I just would again, this is just a, a plea: um, the more people that we have involved, the more people we have in attendance at those meetings. The more people that we have on the front lines that are involved and that are patients and that are that are CEOs that are that are actually uh, participants in the industry, uh, the better the, the better the quality of the information uh, and the better the results. So. Well, Kim, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. From having testified at that first rulemaking thing, when someone stood up and said that a 250 milligram dose was a sufficient dose for a day, and I said, "Have anybody been hung over in this room?" You reach in your Advil bottle and take one Advil, because that's essentially what you're trying to set as a dosing limit. So again, to echo it, not to beat the horse, but please, we need an active patient base and we need a very, very active physician base to get the, the policymakers in Tallahassee to understand that this is a vibrant market that's saving people's lives and it can't just be the old guard kind of ushering in what's going to happen. So I, I think I think uh, and I, we are 100% in agreement on this, but I think we focus on toxicity. The toxicity of cannabis, you can't compare it with the toxicity that you're seeing on the opiates. And I think that, and not just an obvious replacement, I'm talking about any kind of addiction, right? You have got very expensive clinics in Switzerland, very expensive clinics in Germany, that people are paying $5,000 a day to taper off addiction, and they're giving them cannabis, and, and they're giving them high CBD-based cannabis. So I, I think we have to take a, a bigger approach as to the no side effects of cannabis and that the toxicity levels are so much lower than anything else that is out there and then and, and have a combined effort. Uh, I, I definitely think the dosage levels are way too low. Um, and then you're trying to titrate up yeah. from that. By the way, on the GW farm, uh, Epiliomex, the dosage of day is 600 milligrams. Exactly. So here they are trying to kind of dial down the cannabis side of things and yet there's an FDA approved drug, which is by the way great for the industry, right? But it costs $32,500 a year, and it's 600 milligrams a day. Yeah. So, you know, this is part of that conversation. Yeah. Well, I wanted to transition from plant medicine and uh, plant science to basically advertising. Um, could you talk about, <laughs> I know it is. Well, you know, part of that is, is how do you get the message out there? two patients, two people that are able to do it. So what are some of the challenges um, your companies face with regards to how you basically educate the public, the mainstream? Um, what, what do you do to actively, you know, I mean, we, we have Facebook saying the shadow banning uh, cannabis companies. We have um, Google, you can't do ads for, for, for it. So, um, you know, what are some of the challenges and how do you try and overcome those? And I'd like to start with you, Mike, on this one. Yeah, it's, um, this is a very different world that I'm working in today than when I was in the pharmaceutical biotech industry. And it's frustrating because there are times when I want to go back to things that were tried and true from that industry and try them here and, and you, you can't do it. So we have to rely a lot on, on social media 
uh, you know, uh, people sharing their own personal experiences. Um, you know, while I'm up here right now, I just want to uh, offer a plea to my fellow CEOs. We, uh, we uh, have a remarkable opportunity that I don't take for granted, being one of 17 people with licenses in the state. It's incredible. And we have an opportunity to really raise the bar. One of the things that's really frustrating, and I, and I hope this isn't the case, is some of the trashing that I see that goes on on social media. And a lot of it is not real. And I just want to make sure that we're not playing in that space, any of us up here. It's not a space that I want to play in at all. I don't um, play in that space. No. This is, that's great. But so, I, tell, I, mean, I tell you this, you know, about, and, and I could not agree more with you on this, okay? So, so we live in a very different, in a very different and in a very difficult world, you know? You can have a person <coughs> who you've never met in your life make a statement on Facebook or Instagram, and all of a sudden you're ruined, or you're assumed that you're this individual that you've been portrayed. But I'm gonna tell you that we are to blame as an industry for what's going on. Why? Because what we should be doing is we should be using all of our stories, all the eight-year-old that he was talking about, the stories that you have, my father also died of cancer, so I understand you know, the pain that you deal with. So coming together as an industry, just like you see with Gap Young, right? Coming together with an industry and then having the stories that are individual to our companies, okay, and put it in a combined effort to create more access and to educate people that, listen, this is a real medicine, and here you have 17 companies, here you have whatever as many companies want to come in, and they're all sharing their individual stories of the patients that are changing their lives. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be doing is doing that as a combined effort. You can go on Facebook, okay? You can go on Facebook and you can find detailed steps how to build a bomb, slides how to do it, you know, you can buy whatever, you know, craziness you want to buy. Yeah, you cannot communicate with patients. But I'm gonna tell you what is even more difficult to do with this is sensory that we're dealing in California as Florida Congress. I was just telling this to Kim. We are censored because we're here, okay? The national players that are in California that are coming here, they're not censored. They're not censored in Instagram. They're not censored in Facebook. So we live in a very conflicted world. What I think we should be doing is invite the people at Facebook and Instagram and educate them and say, guys, let me help you understand what the world is that we're in here. And let me tell you the stories and perhaps your responsibility is to help us reach the life of as many people as possible so they can be educated and understand that this is available. And that's what we should be coming together. The other stuff that you're talking about, Michael, honestly, I, I, I don't even pay attention to, it's just nice. How many of you have been shut down on Instagram and Facebook? Yes, no. Raise your hand, come on. Everybody. All right, so, so how do you get around that? What are the, some of the things that you do to get to basically get your message out? So I don't know that you can get around it. Um, you know, that's a, that's Facebook, right, has standards and they have certain things that they, I, I wouldn't say that they uniformly apply. I think that the majority of cannabis companies got shut down when Facebook, um, when Mark Zuckerberg was testifying in front of Congress. I think that there was a sweep of Facebook and they're really, I don't, I don't believe that it was company specific. I think that there is certainly efforts to, in where they originate from, I don't, like to speculate in terms of, you know, our pages get taken down, our, our marketing materials get taken down, you know, we're reported, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that happens. I think that, you know, it's about having a multi-phase strategy, um, always, right, in any business. Um, I think that, you know, well, first of all, I would be remiss because she's here and she's the queen of all things social media. So Emily Wood is a real person. So I just like to say that because that's the other thing that people tend to forget about social media is that we are real people and we are dedicating our lives and our passion and our literally every waking minute to this movement and to this industry and so you know it's easy to get behind a keyboard and to, to type something hateful um, right it's much more difficult to have a meaningful conversation and so that's what I love about this panel um, getting to know um, everyone and really trying to connect with patients on an individual basis as much as possible so Going back to the original question in terms of our strategies, you know, it's really about, um, again, it really grows one patient at a time. So individual connections, trying to be present in communities in which we exist. So community partnerships, we're sponsoring the Silver Tour as an education outreach um, to educate seniors on medical cannabis. And we partner with different organizations that are part of the movement. And that's an important part of, of TrueLeaf's DNA. 
Um, and again, it's to raise the level of awareness. But reality is, is that, and you, I think we all know this, right? A human to human interaction is 80% more effective than a social media interaction or an online interaction. And so having and, and delivering quality products, making it accessible for patients, um, that's what's gonna change the conversation in Florida. That's what's gonna continue to elevate the movement. And, and one person tells another person, tells another person, and then all of a sudden a policymaker, a governor, you know, has his sister who has had a good experience from medical cannabis, his grandmother, his mother, right? And so that's, that's what's gonna shift this conversation. And it's, again, keeping it positive, keeping it education focused, and keeping the momentum moving forward, creating commonality in the industry that we can all rally behind and participate in. Did you touch upon that? Right? Yeah, and my colleagues have said it very, very eloquently, so I don't want to belabor it anymore. You have to, it's, part of it has to be organic, and the only rally cry uh, besides opiates that I would make is that everyone in this room and everyone on this panel needs to make a commitment to educating not just the bureaucrats in Tallahassee, but the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. And I have spent a lot of time over the last two years on that JetBlue flight back and forth, and I haven't seen a lot of my fellow industry and compatriots up here. And it, walking into some of these senators and congressmen's offices, they know nothing. They know less than nothing. All they know is, is very old, outdated information, and it takes consistent, repetitive visits and education to get them to understand, A, what this is, B, that 66% 60, 60, of Americans now want it, and see, that is a national platform. We fix stuff in D.C. and get the States Act through, which Senator Cory Gardner and Elizabeth Warren are now gonna have the opportunity to move forward. We get that type of stuff to happen, and it's a much different marketplace. We don't have to worry about Facebook and Instagram at that point, because it's going to be wide open. So ultimately, for me, we need to have a dedicated approach as one of the, no election happens on a national level without Florida playing a very pivotal role. So we have a platform. When the Florida delegation makes phone calls and shows up for things, people listen. We need to make this industry, which is going to be one of the most vibrant states in North America, as far as a medical marijuana industry, and ultimately likely a recreational marijuana industry, the voices need to be heard in Washington, and they need to be heard loud and clear. And that's not there right now. I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And, and, uh, many things come to mind regarding, I, I, I like, although we were just, I don't know that we were called banisher, we were called the old, the old guard, which is what I say. But the three years old. Uh, but I think I think uh, I think that I would like to think that in the world we live in, you can connect with people on a one-to-one -one basis. But this is a media-driven world of social media, and that's where people are getting the information. So if we're being boxed out the way that people have access to information, that makes you know I commend Kim and I know all of us. Uh, are doing community outreach and events, but it's not as effective as we could get in, in, in a social media platform and, and put out, and I think something that, that I would like to propose that we do as, as, as licensees, as a, as a group of professionals in the state of Florida is, we should come with one of those like gut milk, you know, in Instagram and just simply, or in, in the, you see the TV, and as an, as an industry, as responsible operators in the industry, educate people without trying to brand any company. Just simply say, there is cannabis, there's legal, there's conditions. Here's some testimonials for the whatever number of companies are here. Because that's what we're here to do. You know, what we're here to do is to educate people. And what we're also here to do is to make sure that we're professional, make sure that we do not allow people that are bad actors that are out there, and I think that's what Michael was alluding to earlier in the conversation, is that we've all spent a lot of time and effort, we don't see our families, we're very committed to do this, so it's very hurtful for people that they don't know who you are, all of a sudden they, they go into these campaigns uh, that can really hurt the people that you very much are trying to help. So I think that we need to raise the bar as, as players in the industry, uh, in, when you're in our industry producer, and we gotta start getting real about getting people's education out and getting out of the, the weeds, pun intended, yeah. and trying to get into uh, into a real way that we can affect change and help the people that are out there. Because there's a lot of people that are in the state of Florida that don't even know that this is legal. It's crazy as this sounds. There are people that live in the states that they don't know that this medicine is available to them. And I think that's something that we should do a combined effort. Thank you. And uh, one of the other things that uh, I wanted to touch upon is everywhere I go, everybody's talking about cannabis jobs. So I wanted to touch upon 
uh, each one of your companies, how many you employ, um, what kind of uh, jobs you're looking for, and uh, because that's the number one question. That everyone wants to get into the cannabis business, and if they can't get in the business themselves, they want to work for you. So. Awesome. Um, we want them to work for us. Um, so uh, True Leave is, we're just under 1,500 people, um, employees, partners, um, and we're really um, excited to be continuing to grow. Uh, we are hiring a variety of positions, um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in getting into the space to uh, check our website. Um, there's an employment um, opportunities tab at the bottom. Um, and please um, feel free to apply. One of the things that um, we pride ourselves in, and, we're, and again, we're very passionate about, is that we do um, employ patients. And so, um, and we, and that's, that's part of, again, part of kind of what makes us true leave. And so, if you are a patient, you're interested in working in the industry, please, please check us out. Um, and really, it's at all levels. I mean, right now, we're adding folks to our extraction team, we're adding folks to our R&D team. Um, we just moved into a brand new, it's incredible, state-of-the-art um, uh, production facility, it's about 55,000 square feet. Um, and so we've got lots and lots of opportunity there. And then of course we're opening stores and, and we'd love to, to have you join the team on that front as well. So um, one of the things that we look for is we look for obviously positive attitude, willingness to learn, um, if you've got specific expertise in a particular field, that's fantastic. We are looking for a certain PhD and certain quali qualifiers um, for certain positions. Um, and, and really, again, just a passion for the, a passion for the industry. Um, and we have job fairs. Uh, so in terms of our recruitment practices, um, online, of course, then we also have job fairs. We just had a job fair. We had over 100 people. Um, come through and apply, which was exciting to see. And so um, we are the largest employer right now um, where we're based in Northwest Florida. And so again, it's, we, we're, we're based in a, mi a majority minority community, um, one of the poorest communities in the state. And so we're really proud of the fact that we are changing the face and the, and the course and, and history really of that community. And we take that, we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Um, we also are very serious about um, minority employment um, and equal opportunities, and so um, again, we would we would love for all of these spaces to uh, to have the opportunity to come and work for us. Thank you, and Jose, you're a um, a multicultural company as well. I, I, I would say so. It is funny because we were we were going through the application process in Pennsylvania, and they wanted you to write a diversity plan, and I'm like. What is a diversity plan? Well, they want to know what are your plans in like hiring minorities. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Like, you know, everybody that works here, you know, is a minority. We have, you know, more women in executive positions than any of these companies are talking about. We still have to write a minority plan. I thought that, that was interesting. They could have just read uh, the, the biographies of the people that are there. Uh, we are about 250 employees right now, uh, and uh, we're now expanding our cultivation in Florida. Uh, actually relocated the cultivation in Florida to a much, much larger facility. Uh, so we are continuing to hiring people uh, all, and all, over, all over the place. What's, what's interesting uh, for us that we offer for people that come in uh, is that we're a global company. So we have a great place to come in and learn the business and understand best practices and get immediate on-the-job training, whether it's directly dealing with patients or the interaction with the dispensaries or the way that we manufacture. Uh, at our uh, processing facility, and then you can, if they want uh, to have that opportunity, they can be transferred in other places around the world. So uh, you can go into our website as well. Uh, most of our postings are in Indy, and they go from people at the dispensaries. Uh, we have a lot of our team here uh, today. Uh, people from the physician engagement, uh, social media, uh, you name it. Uh, the PhDs that we continue to hire, uh, the uh, research people, uh, plus, there are uh, some of these jobs that are global that are in other countries. So, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, the HR business is uh, is a thriving business for sure, uh, and that department is to be growing just as fast as our accounting department is growing. So, it's a good, it's a good thing. So, one of the most gratifying things of building this business is exactly what we're talking about: being able to offer uh, employment opportunities to a number of people, and, and I have to tell you, we just got our, our license to grow less than a year ago. We have uh, about between Arizona and Florida now, a little over 200 employees there. 
But what I've seen is the power of what happens when you go in with the cannabis business in an area that's depressed. Uh, I didn't mention the fact that we have ownership in the largest outdoor grow in the U.S., Los Buenos Farms in Pueblo, Colorado. And I've seen what it has done to Pueblo, the, the cannabis industry for Pueblo. I've seen uh, right now what's happening in Ruskin, an area where the tomato business is not going as well as it used to be. Um, it's, just, it's just terribly exciting. And then I think of the business that we built in a place that none of you have ever heard of, in Coolidge, Arizona, which is in the middle of nowhere between Tucson and Phoenix in the desert. And we are the largest employer in, in Coolidge right now. So I have to tell you, uh, first and foremost, it's the patients. We love what we're bringing to our patients. But the other piece that's really exciting to me are the great opportunities we're providing to people. And Florida's going to be a big opportunity for all of us. When we all have 30 dispensaries and increasing our production and manufacturing, uh, we're talking about getting to the level that Kim's at right now, well over 1,000 employees in Florida. So it's exciting. I mean, we are going to be the second largest producing state in the union. Yeah. So Florida is definitely uh, number two. I mean, largest population over the age of 65 in North America, number one tourist destination uh, in the world. We so need to get reciprocity. Yeah, too. We're going to have a massive opportunity, but between Toronto, London, and Florida, we've got around 200 employees presently. We are relocating. Uh, we're going to keep the production facility in Ruskin that we currently have. And then we are have acquired a, a large site uh, about an hour, about 90 minutes north of here. Uh, we wanted to be closer to the South Florida area where a lot of the patient base was. Uh, that, we're, that we'll have to staff up extensively. And obviously, as the dispensaries come online in the first quarter of 19, uh, we'll be hiring and doing job fairs. We do believe in hiring patients, especially for the dispensary experience. Uh, if, if, if it's something that's changed their lives, it's a great idea to have them also explain how potential other patients, how it's changed their life. So again, person-to-person -person contact uh, as always still is, harking back to the old days, the best way to do it. So we believe in, in a diverse environment. We also believe in hiring key people that are gonna be able to help get the word out. And we're very excited to make a, we've already made a substantial investment in Florida. We're very excited to continue that investment in Florida and, and elsewhere.